Hey everyone, and welcome to Startup Savants. I'm Annika. And I'm Ethan. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. And if you're new, this podcast is about the stories behind startups, the founders who run them, and the problems they're solving. Today, our guest is Andrew Gershfeld. Andrew is an ex-entrepreneur turned venture capitalist and board member to some pretty big companies such as Flow Health. Hey, Andrew, welcome to the show. How's it going? Uh, Hi, thank you for hosting me. That's an amazing opportunity. We are super excited um, and we've had some great interviews um, surrounding venture capital before, so we're stoked to get more into this with you. Um, And let's start with your background. You were an entrepreneur and now you're an investor and a board member um, at several companies. Can you tell us about the entrepreneurial journey? Um, What kind of businesses did you start? Well, in fact, that's, that was not a very straightforward journey. Uh, I'm uh, a scientist by my major degree. I had my master's degree in physics and math. But during the last year at college, my friends and I decided to build a startup. Um, well, it was a, the idea was very clear, like a small pocket size projector that could create a high resolution uh, image of a decent size, let's say like 36 inch diagonal. Uh, It was based on the tech that we were researching at that time. Uh, We built a prototype that was of a size of a typical PC of that that time. Uh, It was 2007. So if you could remember the size of PCs, it was like, uh, room quite size. a huge, yeah, yeah, big. <laughs> so we, we decided to fundraise to create a pocket version of it, uh, and that was the worst uh, in, at science from the whole team. So the burden of fundraising, creating business plan, and pitching investors became mine. Um, and uh, in a few months, like about five months, we generated uh, a term sheet from one, one of the hardware investors. But then the recession came Mm. and the deal fell apart and the company didn't didn't take the path uh, we intended uh, to make. So one of our advisors suggested to me that I should go for management consulting uh, for a while to get a better understanding of the business, et cetera. And like he he saw, I was uh, like just a graduate. So he said like, okay, it would be beneficial for you to learn more about business. I see you like interested in that. And I spent three years at management cons- consulting. And then in 2010, I started a new company. It was just around the time when the group home clones were appearing all over the world. And I made my own. Uh, I had a plan to bootstrap it but very quickly realized that competitors that attracted VC money were taking over me. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the decision was to sell it quickly. In 2011, uh, there was an M&A and I decided to spend more time understanding the VC market and, and what it is. So that's the story measurably about how it came into, into the VC. Yeah. And what was, how did you make the choice to transition into investing or did that just kind of, it just kind of followed the path? Um, well, in fact, uh, because I was fascinated on how venture capital could dramatically accelerate the growth of the business, uh, compared to, to other forms of uh, capital or f- other t- uh, forms of growing the companies, like Bootstrap, for example. Uh, it was curiosity that uh, drove me there. And the desire to build actually never left me. So the f- f- investment firm Flynn Capital is our own startup. We treat it as a growing company that comes through all the stages of its life, even if it is 10 years now. So it's the mix. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I think there might be a personality type that's drawn into VC and investing. And we had someone 
their job they wanted to be when they grew up was an accountant. And I'm like, man, that's completely opposite from me. Um, what is something you brought with you from your time as an entrepreneur that impacts your role as an investor? Mainly two things. First thing is the importance of listening to others. That uh, both helps entrepreneur to navigate uh, the most effective path through uh, all the challenges that they face. Uh, and it also benefits the investor's ability to make good decisions and to help their portfolio companies. And the second thing is understanding the challenges of being an entrepreneur. Mm. Investors are very different than entrepreneurs. We are not at the steering wheel. So many who has never been there and done that, uh, they don't understand what it means to lead the company, what kind of responsibilities accompany such leadership. Um, so I think that helps a lot uh, me and our team that has that experience, because not only me, but all my partners being uh, founders themselves to speak the same language, to have the right kind of empathy to our portfolio founders and to be, for, be there for them. That's one of the uh, major learnings. So right now here in the US and in lots of places around the world, we're working through a bit of a let's call it an unfriendly economic climate. So from your specific standpoint, what are you seeing in the world of startups and how long do you think this downturn is going to last? Uh, well, I definitely don't have a crystal ball and say how long. <laughs> Darn, that's what we were looking for. Uh, it, it can be a very, very large range of, uh, uh, of the estimates. estimates. So, uh, for the startup world, I think there will be less money available in the market. And um, they will be allocated very differently compared to several previous years when we had almost uh, startup bonanza. So I think that would be the most impacting factors in the next couple of years. What do you think the, the kind of um, phases of an economic downturn are? Uh, I mean, are there kind of discernible, like this is phase one, uh, everything is terrible. This is phase two, it's still bad, but maybe it's less less bad. Um, what, uh, do, is there any specific way that you kind of look at that? Yeah, um, mainly I think that uh, we, we have passed the phase of uh, accepting majorly have passed the phase of accepting the reality that there is a sh uh, there, there are less money in the market. It's harder to, to get investors uh, being excited uh, in what you uh, what you're raising right now. It's a reset of the valuations that we will be facing soon. So I think the acceptance of the reality, this first phase we, we, we already passed. But uh, I think the next phase is like understanding where it all, all will lead us and what kind of uh, um, what kind of challenges could be uh, through that uh, way. So uh, I think we currently are at the moment when uh, most of the companies have to answer the question that are they prepared to the worst case scenario? Uh, and what kind of that worst case scenario can be for them? Because there are many of the businesses that would benefit on the, uh, any kind of economic turbulence or downturn. Um, for example, a lot of automation that is happening right now, it helps to reduce costs and save real money for the enterprise and for the world. Uh, they will definitely be uh, prospering through this time. So those kind of... Uh black swan type companies where they, you know, they just do okay for a little while and then something happens and they don't get hurt from it. They take a major benefit from it. Is that what you're saying? 
Uh, I would add here is that uh, pandemic accelerated a lot of shift to um, the g- digital transformation, but then we have a like a cool down of uh, the economy right now, and the cool down is usually good for turning on the efficiencies, and it accelerates another part of uh, uh, transformation, like. Uh, uh, for example, AI that enables a lot of things uh, previously done by people and can scale up things uh, dramatically. Uh, it's definitely a def- deflationary force that would help us to uh, save more money and uh, would save profits for enterprise and would uh, definitely transform the kind of work people do. So I would say it's it's not just a purely black swan. It's just the acceleration of existing trends uh, on both ways. First, awareness of the technology that the pandemic did, and now the adoption of the technology that uh, economic downturns uh, lead to. All right. So we've talked about the, uh, you know, a few of the different phases that uh, that downturns can take. Um, we uh, we tried to get you to to uh, say how long it was going to last, and, and you didn't take the bait. You didn't give us a prediction. That's fine. Um, but let's move on to actionable steps. What is the first step that you would encourage a startup to take to prepare for an impending economic downturn? Oh, oh like always, I would suggest that focus is the most important thing. And the first thing we did in our portfolio, we reached out to our CEOs and asked them to accept the reality that is a downturn on the capital markets. They must prepare now because speed matters here. And uh, historically, the companies that prepare in advance tend to survive better. So they have to model different scenarios of the future and make sure that they can survive the worst. So that's the major uh, steps that we encourage our portfolio founders to make. And um, as far as the planning and calculating, what things can startups and founders do to plan and prepare for the next 24 months? Well, it seems like... uh, when you when you are in that position, when you have some kind of uh, unpredictable future, it's very important to prioritize your brand control, especially in the market where we entered right now, where uh, the funding is limited. So you should have the runway for at least this 24 months, uh, burn multiple, that is how much you burn to create $1 in a, in a new ARR. Uh, this burn multiple should be as low as possible. And uh, cash flow during the downturn is the most important. It is more important than sometimes than revenue grows. I, I think at the current environment, it's definitely more important. Uh, so if you com- the reason is simple. If your company survives, and the economy starts to grow and everything is fine, you will be able to win the market uh, and the piece of, of share of the competitors that uh, didn't survive. A moment ago, you mentioned focus. Um, tell, us what, tell us what that means to you. What should they focus on? Oh, okay. So... Um, I think the major focus should be on how you spend the resources that you have. So focusing your investments. Resources are limited, so you should focus on investments that drive profitability and EBITDA. Uh, rather than uh, like selling, uh, accelerating to the scale when you sell uh, a dollar for 99 cents. So I think it's time to build 
product-driven growth with healthy unit economics, and uh, it's time to build real business. Cool. So what are some of your recommended strategies for startups that they just got caught up in the bad timing? They, they haven't gotten their funding um, and they're now seeking funding in maybe one of you know the least friendly funding times. What do you, what do you what do you want to see those companies doing? Uh, well, they should secure as much funding as possible. So you've got the recent round or like the previous round. Go to the ones that wanted but couldn't get to get into the round and offer them some extra space. Maybe you get a quick yes. Uh, go to venture debt. Try to you leverage that kind of uh, funding option. Accepting a flat or sometimes a down round, like lower valuation, is still at the table. As, as I said previously, it's better to survive now than uh, like die and see how uh, your competitors that were maybe doing not that great product have passed through that time. And um, the percentage of something valuable that survives, the small percentage of something valuable that survives is much more valuable than 100% of, uh, of zero. So I think uh, that, that, is, uh, that is the way. So you mentioned valuations. What are you seeing with the trends of valuations? I mean, is is the is the math just completely different in how VCs are, are kind of coming up with these numbers? Have we reached a bottom? Uh, well, it's it's hard to tell about uh, the bottom because uh, market timing is a very bad. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. But on the other side, a good approximation, like a, a good example, what what what's happening with valuations is the uh, Nasdaq index, and uh, what you see with the public market translates with a certain uh, time uh, into the private markets. The valuations of the growth stage. Uh, company uh, at the growth stage has been uh, cut dramatically. We've hit, we've all heard the stories of uh, selling secondaries or making down rounds with the companies that were uh, like cutting ninety or eighty percent of the previous valuation down. Uh, on average, I would say uh, we're reduced to a very healthy multiples on a growth stage, and. Because investing at different stages is the game of uh, like who will come next and how much the next investor will be willing to pay. When you see that the growth stage investors are not ready to pay high multiples, uh, earlier stage investors start to adjust, start to adjust uh, their uh, valuations. Um, I think we are getting to more healthy environment right now. The difference is that. At, at the early stage, we have much more capital already committed to the funds and much more capital called already uh, that actually enables a little bit of uh, better uh, capital inflows in early stage, like seed and Series A investments. So maybe we will see less uh, valuation uh, uh, plummeting in early stage compared to what we have seen at the growth stage. But what I'm saying is an average to the whole market. Of course, some companies will be doing great. They will, be see, they will see um, good unit economics, good growth. Uh, there, there will be a line of investors to put money in and so, we would, we would see uh, very, very good deals for uh, founders of such companies. But uh, um, again, uh, an overall trend has been, uh, as I described, and the baseline has been reset already. 
Okay, so you mentioned a couple of terms that uh, I just want to get a quick definition on. Um, can you tell us what selling secondaries means? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, selling secondaries uh, is selling the existing shares of the company from one investor or shareholder of the company to another. It is different to issuance of the shares when the company sells newly issued shares to an investor and the money comes into the company. When you sell secondaries, money don't come into the company. They come from the pocket of new shareholder to an old shareholder, meaning that secondaries usually have a little bit better uh, mark uh, valuation benchmark because uh, it is a transaction between uh, the party that is willing to sell existing asset to another party that is willing to buy existing asset for real money. Because sometimes investors that are buying newly issued shares, they can pay premium because they understand how this money will drive the growth of the company. At the same time, when you sell secondaries because money don't go to the company, you actually are buying and selling at an exact price that this asset, that those two sides believe that asset uh, worth. Thank you. All right, one more. Uh, tell us what a down round is. Okay, down round is typically the investment round that is priced at a lower price per share than the previous ones. One, two, or three previous rounds, no matter what. But if the price at a newly issued shares uh, at a new round is lower than any of the previous ones, it is called a down round. As a result of the down round, it usually dilutes uh, previous shareholders uh, most stronger than uh, normally a, a flat round or an up round. All right. What changes has Flint Capital made to prepare the founders that you all have already invested in for the economic hardships? Uh, as long as, as we understood what, and create a, our understanding of what would be going on, what is going on, we decided um, to make a large allocation towards uh, follow-on investments larger than we typically do. The goal is to give our best portfolio companies as much runway as they need to, to pass uh, it over to the next level of metrics and uh, to, to actually survive that uh, period of turbulence. Uh, we, so the initial idea was to focus a little bit more on existing portfolio. We still continue to invest. We have uh, launched a new uh, fund that would be making initial investments. And we have done already a few investments from that fund. Uh, and we also have launched uh, an opportunity fund that actually helps existing companies, portfolio companies that are doing the best, uh, uh, the gems in our portfolio to accelerate and have a good uh, support of money uh, through their lifetime. Opportunity Fund will be investing in later stages like Series C and etc. cetera, uh, up uh, and uh, with a bigger check size, it's like 15 million or more. That is a good amount of money. Uh, wow. Um, so as far as we're, we're heading into something, if we're going to, you know, actually call it a recession someday, cool. It's so a downturn, cool. Everyone kind of knows something's happening. For people that may still be planning to start a business, is there, is, should they wait? Should they have all of their ducks all the way in a row before they go for it? Or do you think there's still wiggle room in the VC market to help people out like that? Absolutely. So uh, I, I'm a venture capitalist and uh, 
in venture capitalists, you have to be optimistic. Otherwise, uh, you, you cannot write a check to something that actually exists only in the mind of a few people. So I think that downturn is an excellent time to start something. We have seen it through many previous downturns. 2008 was a great example of new companies uh, that are currently the tech leaders of the world that emerged in that uh, period of, of downturn. So I believe that this one would not be an exception. So, and in fact, in early stage, as I mentioned before, in early stage, like seed and series A investments, there is still enough capital to support great ideas and great entrepreneurs. And uh, we have seen that most of the companies, large companies have freezed uh, hiring and many of them actually are reducing the number of uh, actually make, making layoffs. Mm -hmm. uh, some companies are doing quite big layoffs. But the statistics shows that, for example, tech talent from those companies that have been laid off it finds the job in 95% uh, 95 of time, uh, like in a couple of months, in the startups at earlier stages. And their, uh, their expertise from these corps for uh, their knowledge is very helpful uh, for younger younger startups, and uh, I think that is a good flow of talent that actually could accelerate uh, the process of creating new companies. So there is no good time or a bad time. I think now is the right time to start uh, something. If you feel like you have a good idea, you have found the market and uh, you feel that there is a business model and the, the need that could be served. Yeah, yeah. I think, of course, of course, Nike got it. Just do it. But I think it's, I mean, it's good advice all the way around. Um, yeah. What is your number one piece of advice for entrepreneurs? Uh, build your, your support circle. Being an entrepreneur has a lot of uh, ups, uh, ups and downs in the mood, in the business, in everything. And having a support circle of people who can uh, give you advice or just listen to you and just uh, talk it through is uh, one of the most uh, important uh, findings that I made myself through the time of being an entrepreneur. So I think uh, that is uh, something that everyone should be uh, creating for themselves. Yeah. And uh, a lot of, a lot of founders we've talked to have said, yeah, have your support network, have your little mentor circle. Um, and I'm always curious to know how you find those people. Like, how do we actually find them? Oh, I, I, uh, like I would, I would separate a little bit, uh, those who like give you more professional, uh, kind of advice from those who uh, can be your buddies discussing uh, some life life changing moments, but uh, because the second ones they, they, they uh, you you you, 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 you like create them through the time, uh, but you definitely should know who they are before you like uh, fully into into something. With the professional ones, you know it's always good to to talk to people and tell them what you're doing and uh, listen. As I said, uh, listen. Uh, I, I'm, I'm always fascinated about how tech ecosystem works in terms of supporting each other. Uh, when you tell someone that you are building something, usually people try, the, the, the initial thing, they, they, they want to try to help you. And uh, we've seen a lot of times when very brilliant uh, founders uh, got very quickly to uh, to experience CEOs uh, meeting with them, and they became their mentors or advisors, just because, well, 
people sometimes want to um, to pass their knowledge and to 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 feel like still in the game because uh, many of the successful founders and uh, CEOs they don't feel that kind of um, driving force when they're on the top of a large uh, corporation or something like that. They won't still have that uh, uh, adrenaline and uh, everything associated with the younger startup that is uh, coming from zero to one. Um, so the network is the best uh, supporter here and telling people about what you are doing and what you are, what is the vision that you are um, pursuing. Yeah. So you have, you have the happy hour support circle and then you've got like the, the business professional mentor circle. I could, yeah, yeah that, that sounds like fun. Um, and how can our listeners connect with you or Flint capital? Absolutely. So LinkedIn, Andrew Gershwood, always there. Uh, and, uh, my email ag at flintcap.com. That's easy. <laughs> sure is. All right. But just in case it's not easy enough, we're going to put all of that in the show notes over at startupsavant.com slash podcast. Andrew, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your stories with us. This has been really great. Thank you, guys. All right. And that is going to be all for today's episode of the Startup Savants podcast. Thanks for joining us today on this special episode of the pod. So since today's episode was a little shorter, I will continue that trend by keeping this outro nice and tight. Please share this podcast with those who you think it would benefit. That is literally all we ask. For tools, guides, videos, startup stories, and so much more, head over to truic.com. That's truic.com, T-R-U-I-C.com. See ya. Bye everyone.